was about to wave okay. and yep. perfect timing. Okay, there you are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last Friday transportation seminar of the fall term of 2011, even. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dill. I'm faculty here in Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleague, Professor Chris Monsier, we organized the seminar this term. For those of you who are students enrolled in this as a class, I want to remind you that your written assignment, if you're taking this for a grade, is due Tuesday by 5 p.m. If you're taking the USP version of the course, it's due to me. If you're taking the civil engineering version, it's due to Professor Monsier. Um, and the requirements were spelled out in the syllabus. Ask us questions afterwards if you need to, but the 5 p.m. Tuesday is the due date. Uh, so without further, oh, Christopher Monsieur, a question. <laughs> oh, email is acceptable as an attachment, but one single document. So if you're doing the reflective journal as your written assignment, I don't want to see ten separate <laughs> documents, one for each week, or nine, or eight, actually, because we had two holidays this term. So one single document. But yes, email, uh, attachment to an email is acceptable for both of us for that. Um, okay, and then a reminder, we, I think, maybe have some new faces here today. Uh, or if you haven't been here in a while, we do webcast these seminars, which means there are people watching on the web. Um, so when we get to the point to ask questions of the speaker, we like you to use the microphones that are on most of the tables. Hold the touch button, keep the red light lit while you're asking the question. If for some reason it doesn't work, like right there, or if you don't have one, one of us will come around with a portable mic and play Phil Donahue and, and uh, record your question. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over um, to our speaker, Roger Chen. Uh, Roger is a postdoc here in civil and environmental engineering. He's been here about a year and a half now, uh, working with the Oregon Modeling Collaborative under Professor Kelly Clifton. Um, he got his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from University of Maryland, and he's been working sort of various travel demand modeling topics. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Roger. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so topic of today's talk is about market segmentation based on observed travel activity patterns. And so what this essentially comes down to is a classification problem. And so we'd like to classify people based on the way they make their travel and activity decisions. So, um, okay. So as I've mentioned um, briefly, the classification problem has been a traditional interest in the transportation modeling sort of research area. And so there's a lot of labels out there that we like to place on people. So in the, for example, in the residential choice sort of line of thought, we like to say whether someone is a busy urbanist or they're some elderly homebody person or um, they're a transit user. And likewise, in some other sort of topical areas in transit marketing, we like to know who the light travels are or people who are monomodal in their sort of travel mode choice and people who are more complex and um, do more sort of multimodal sort of trips. Um, in addition to that, uh, recently in the sort of EV sort of research area, there's a need to sort of identify what different market segments for this sort of, um, you know, uh, product looks like. And so um, there's a lot of, you know, labels there as well. There are visionary early adopters, and then there's another sort of segment called pragmatic early adopters. But needless to say, the literature is full of lots of labels, and we like to put them on different people. So some background on the problem of classification. It's not a, it's not a new problem. It's been looked at several times, actually, already. Um, and so three general sort of methods I found in the literature for looking at this is, one, people typically do it through an econo econometric framework. And so um, there's sort of two sort of classes of these studies, people who do use sort of exogenous segmentation, which is based on people's observed characteristics. These are things like sex and income. There's a sort of more sophisticated approach, which tries to look for these latent segments. And so these are segments that aren't uh, immediately obvious to people. Um, so those would be like the topics or you know the um, labels like urbanist or um, light travels, et cetera. 
And then there are some studies who look at classification but look at it from a specific policy standpoint. And so there's been studies done on mode choice and looking and developing a mode choice index for classifying people. Um, and then there are still some more innovative methods that look at the sequence of different activity patterns. And so this um, one set of studies here by Timmermans and his collaborators, they took a protein sequencing algorithm and tried to apply it to activity patterns. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different ways for classifying people. And um, some of them work well for some areas and not you know, other research areas. But um, just to let you know, there's a lot of stuff out there on it. So before I delve into the topic of this, today's talk, which is on classifying travel patterns, I thought it would be good to sort of get on the same page and sort of uh, wrap our heads around what do we mean by travel and activity patterns. And so in a sort of typical activity travel you know, data set, we see a lot, a lot of different kind of um, sort of observations or patterns. Um, so some are really simple patterns. And so this one observation um, was at home pretty much in the morning. He went to work. He did some sort of work-related activity. And then he ended up back at home. And so this is you know, rather simple. He just basically went to work. And he went to go do some sort of work-related task. And he came back home. Another pattern, um, this person was at home in the morning. He went to the bank, went to the store. He drove to his parents' house, um, and he picked them up. And he went to work. And then after work, he went to the gas station to fill up, uh, obviously. He did some household errand. He went back to drop his parents off. And then he ended up back at home. So compared to the previous pattern, this is a bit more complex. So this person didn't just go straight to work. He decided to add some other activities along his tour. Um, and then on the extreme end, we have very, very complex patterns. And so this is um, going to be a pattern for a four-member household. And so two members of this household were at home in the morning. Okay, They went together to go pick up two other people. This person one, who was the parent, drove to the high school to drop off these picked up passengers. And then he went to work. Another person in the household was at home in the morning as well. This person walked to the bus stop, which took him to his elementary school. And um, going back to the first person, for some reason, he decided to go back home during the middle of the day and go back to work. And then there's the other person, the other parent in this household. She was actually at work in the morning. And then she went back home. And wait, oh, sorry. And um, she was there for some time. But going back to person four and uh, the other sort of high school student, they went back home um, after school. And together with the second parent, they went to the mall to go have dinner. This first parent met up with them there from his work location. So what happened was this person person two went to church after dinner. The two children that came with her stayed at the mall with the first parent. And the first parent drove them back. And then eventually, this person two returns home herself. And so you know, there's a lot of escorting going along here. But what this is meant to illustrate is that travel patterns are very complex. There's no real sort of obvious definition of them. And they can vary significantly across many dimensions. So it's very hard to sort of just put labels on different patterns. But that's what we're going to try to do in this um, seminar talk. So given that, um, we can finally start talking about the objectives for the seminar. So we have these patterns here. And so one of the tasks, as suggested by the title, as suggested by me talking about market segmentation, is that we want to classify these patterns into some segments. And so we have these observed patterns. You know, I showed you four, but I mean, there's actually more in the data set. And we'd like to put some label on them. And we'd like some methodology to be able to do this. And so going back to the previous slide on different approaches for classifying uh, different travelers. And so in terms of travel patterns, what we really want to do is somehow capture these sort of space-time characteristics of the patterns, because they're you know, the ones that really matter when we think about complex travel patterns. We want to pay particular attention to capturing the sequence of activities whether they decide to go shopping in the morning before their trip to work, or whether it comes afterwards. And the sort of timing of this, does everything get bunched up in one sort of um, 
part of the day, or does it get more evenly distributed uh, throughout? And I'm sorry, I missed something here. Yeah. When I say segments here, I mean a class of people. And so in an area, you have a group of people that you want to classify based on their travel patterns. And so sets of people. There are sets of people, yes. So that's a yeah, that's segment. So, so these are different patterns for different peoples. And I want to put each person in a segment based on their pattern. Right? And so that's the final outcome of this, pretty much. Um, and so in addition to that, we'd also like to somehow capture these interdependencies between patterns. And so these patterns aren't always independent. Sometimes they're dependent on um, what other sort of household members are you know, in this sort of mix. And so when I was thinking about a methodology to do this, I was you know, going through the literature, and there were sort of econometric methods, which are very data intensive. And they're actually very specialized in any sort of choice problem. You really need to know what the choice set is. Well, in terms of patterns, it's really hard to define that choice set. Um, and then there's, you know, remember there were those studies that look at specific indices, and I thought, well, if I had a specific index to describe a pattern, that might be a little bit misleading and too simplistic. And so I had come across some literature on pattern recognition and signal processing methods for classifying different patterns. And so traditionally, these methods have been applied to looking at um, not travel patterns, but things like sound waves, or um, some sort of speech recognition sort of uh, problem, or to look at um, uh, you know, lie detection. So that's another popular thing, is the lie detector is sort of a classification problem. You're trying to classify if someone's a liar or not based on their signals. And so it's the same concept applied here. So I you know, envision people as giving us these travel signals, and I want to classify them based on them. And then in the end, once I have these segments, I want to look at who are the members in each of these segments? So, so this is you know what's going to happen in the next few slides. So my sort of methodological framework for looking at this. So in any sort of signal processing or pattern recognition framework, there's basically three steps. So first is you want to specify a pattern that you want to classify. Second, based on this, you want to extract some features from which you are going to classify uh, these patterns based on. And the third final step is there's going to be some kind of classification through some sort of clustering algorithm. And so at the end of this sort of process in this study, you have segments, okay, so each person, these are patterns for different people, they are labeled according to some segment, and then there's a set of um, feature, um, features that describe each of these people. Um, so moving on, um, I'll talk about the first step first, which is pattern specification. So from a travel activity data set, we get an observed pattern, which I had mapped out for you previously. And we want to extract, uh, we, not feature extract, we want to define some pattern from which we are going to classify these people based on. And following this sort of signal processing framework, these patterns should vary over time. And they should be wave-like in form. And so that was you know, one thing I had to think about here. And so one dimension I looked at was distance from home. And so if you think about the way people travel, your distance from home is sort of wave-like. You start off at home, you travel some distance away, and you come back home. Right? And so, so you can get this you know, from the observed travel pattern. You just determine the uh, distance of different locations from their home location. Okay? I had to make some other assumptions here. So I want to look at activity type. And so to sort of generate you know, the sort of pattern that I needed for activity type, I had to make some assumption on the sort of nominal classification of different activities. So I assigned an index for each activity type so that I may have some pattern over time. And I did the same thing for mode choice. So based on this, um, the classification is gonna, base on, gonna be based on these three sort of dimensions I've defined here. And um, the next step, feature extraction, will work on these three patterns. So from the observed pattern, and these assumptions here. Oh, yeah, switch your mic down. Oh, okay. That's fine. Okay, so now I lost. 
lost my train of thought. Oh, you have a question. Great. Wait. Oh, OK, it's a technical. Oh, no, it's not. OK. Yeah. It could be. It could be. So that I, had, I had some logic behind this. And so I wanted home and travel to look very different on this, right? And so I had home be 9. I had travel be negative 9. So there would be a strong contrast. Um, work and work-related activities are somewhat similar. And so in this sort of pattern here, I wanted them to look similar. So I gave them an index close to each other. Um, and then the same thing with mode. And so how I had to find it here was I had 0 for if you weren't traveling. And then if there was a sort of travel sort of segment, then I would assign some index based on that. And so I wanted something very different between walk and bike and driving. And so walk and bike has 9. And driver, if you are the driver of a car, you had negative 9. So that was part of the logic. And so I thought someone would ask this. But so I have a sort of nominal scale here. And Typically, that raises some concerns. But since this task is one of classification, right? So nominal scale doesn't you know, really pay attention to the distance between um, sort of these indices. Um, because it's for classification purposes, it should be fine. Because what we really want is a difference between each of these sort of uh, dimensions. And so as long as there's a difference for us to classify based on, we should be OK. Um, so moving on. So the second step was feature extraction. And so this um, really follows the sort of signal processing sort of framework here, is that you have a specified pattern. I had discretized it into time steps, so I had t observations for each of these dimensions over time. And then what needs to happen is it needs to be transformed to a frequency um, to a different space so that we may do some sort of classification. And so for in this particular in instance, I chose um, a Walsh transform, but you can always do another type of transform. You can do a Fourier transform possibly, and a hard transform, which is you know, used for square-like waves. But in this case, I just did a Walsh transform. And based on this transform, you get a set of, they're called coefficients in the literature, um, actually that, um, which are the sort of extracted features. So in the second step, what happens is we have these patterns that we specified. They've been turned into this matrix by me discretizing it over time steps. And they've gone through some transformation. Um, to a different space, which we can classify based on. Um, and so another sort of analogy for this transformation is the sort of movement from polar to um, Cartesian coordinates. And so you do that a lot in math um, for various reasons. Um, but you know, part of it is so that because these dimensions are in different units, you want them sort of to be on the same one. Um, and so the third step, which is pattern classification. So Based on the feature extraction, you have these coefficients uh, for each of these patterns. They go through a clustering algorithm. And so in this case, I did one based on Euclidean distance, but you can pick another one. And then based on that clustering algorithm, then you get clusters associated with each of these patterns. And so each of these patterns is assigned to a segment. OK. So second part of this analysis, you have these segments. And for each segment, you actually have the centroid, which is you know, somewhat like the mean but different, of all the coefficients for each segment. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to have some sort of representation of each segment. So in addition to assigning each person to a membership of a segment, I want to get some sense or some means of interpreting what each of these segments means. So in a lot of the earlier studies, they've attached labels to each person. But those are actually their subjective interpretation of what each segment means. So the authors that did the residential choice one, they thought, oh, segment one were urbanists based on their sort of assessment of the um, characteristics of the segment. And so same case here. So once I have these segment memberships, I want to be able to interpret them somehow. And so there is an inversion process, which is sort of like the reverse of feature extraction. And then there's also a sort of check here where we look at members of each segment and see what sort of um, social demographic characteristics they have. And so, so that, you know, this is the sort of end of my methodology or analysis for this um, you know, set of um, uh, results. So. so the data set I used, I took um, a sample of observations from the ODOT Region 2 data set. And so this is Region 2. 
if you're familiar with the Oregon geography. And I, in this case, for this seminar talk, I only looked at patterns with mandatory work activities. And so since this was sort of the first time I was trying this method, I sort of wanted to reduce the burden on the sort of classification part. And so I could have looked at the universe of you know, travel patterns. I could have looked at patterns with school activities, school tours. I could have looked at, um, I don't know, things that didn't, or patterns that didn't fall into work or school. But I decided to just look at work, sort of mandatory work, you know, tour patterns with mandatory work activities in this set, uh, just to give the um, method a leg up. And I took time slices at every 5.25 minutes, so I had 625 slices. So at the end of all of this, I had um, 9, 10 sort of different segments. Um, and so the, as you can see, they sort of vary in terms of their um, characteristics. And so you have some segments that are very long distance. Uh, there's uh, one here where it was like long distance work trips, 40, 60 miles from home. They, you know, on average, the social demographics were about the same, but there's actually some variation in the distribution for each segment. And, um, and you know, the membership numbers actually vary too. And so the segment that had the most people was segment D. And so these are people that worked five to six miles from home. They didn't do any evening travel and they went back home. And then there is, um, because the classification method I used, the clustering algorithm, was very sensitive to outliers. I had to remove about 17 of them to make it work, um, but that was sort of less than 1% of the whole sort of population. So I want to look at some of these segments in detail now, and so I think the next one is D. Okay, so a bit about how to interpret this. So this is the composite image for each segment from the inverse of um, the transform, and then this is here to show you the socioeconomic distribution for each segment. This is for D, which was work tours within five and six miles of home, and there were no evening activities. As you can see, at the start of the day, people were at home, and then they sort of went about five to six miles, then they came back. In terms of their activity patterns, okay, they were at home in the beginning, they went to work, and then they eventually went back home. And then one unfortunate thing that uh, was result of this analysis was that, so for mode type, it actually shows a lot of insensitivity. Um, and so what I had ideally liked to have seen was either you know, spikes towards one end or the other, indicating whether people were more prone towards walking or biking, or they were sort of more auto-oriented. Um, but I didn't get that. And then um, in terms of the distribution of socioeconomic characteristics, right, and so, um, in this one, there were a lot of respondents, you know, lots of them were the respondents of the surveys, either the um, partners or spouses, and most of these people were between 45 and 54 years of age. And as we can see from their primary travel mode to work, a lot of them were auto people, but there were a few walkers and bikers and auto passengers. So comparing this to another segment, so this is segment F. These were the people who had really long travel distances. And so looking at distance from home, you can see that they were at home in the beginning. They went some great distance over time, and then they eventually went back home. Um, in their activity type, we saw, we saw a lot more sort of definition then. So they were at home, they went to work, and then went back home. And then in this case, we had more of a sort of profile for mode type. And so there were more auto-oriented people in this segment than in the previous one. And looking at the distribution of these socioeconomic uh, demographics, a lot of these people were the respondents of the um, survey. A lot of these people were auto drivers. More of these people were telecommuters. So this one was about 22, 23%. And the previous one was actually less than that. And I guess as expected, or maybe not as ex expected, a lot of these people were between 45 and 54 years of age. So segment A, which was people who had a work tour within five to six miles of, miles of home. Actually, it should be, uh, yeah, that's right. And then um, and they had some evening travel um, when the evening came around. And so we look at the profile for this, and so these people were at home. And then they traveled some really great distance away from home, more than five to six. And then they eventually went back home. 
And so this is also reflected in this activity pattern here, where you had people start off at home, they went to work, they did some sort of shopping activity, and then they went back home. And so this was, mode type was insensitive once again. And in terms of the distribution of these socioeconomics, um, we had more people who were in the 35 to 45 category. Um, and more of these people were actually the spouse and partners of the surveys with respect to the respondent um, than the other sort of um, segments. And this segment had fewer telecommuters. And I guess not surprising, a lot of these people were auto drivers as well. The final segment, which was H, which is a really odd one. Um, so these people had some multiple trips over time. They uh, had some evening travel, which was you know when they were the farthest away from home, which was around 20 to 40 miles. And so these, these people basically had a more random pattern. And so they all started off at home. And then they all sort of migrated away. And eventually, they went back home, at least most of them. Um, and then there is you know, some variation in the activity type here. And mode was, once again, sort of insensitive. Um, <coughs> but in terms of the social demographics, we had sort of a tighter distribution around a lot of these. So are there any questions so far? <coughs> OK. Yes? Um, well, I was just wondering if you, um, the, the survey area is very, uh, very diverse. Yeah. It has a lot of, uh, no, no metropolitan areas, but a lot of, uh, in this particular sample, but a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller cities. And, uh, and I just wondered if you looked at the geographic distribution of these different segments. Yeah. So I had intended to do that. Um, I actually didn't do it yet, because I was having trouble getting those variables. But that probably would explain some of the variation even more. Um, but it, it, it was in my queue of things to do. So I did you know, think about it. Um, it's a matter of time before I get to it, though. So I was happy to get to this point. So, right. so anyway, um, uh, yes. OK, so moving on. So segment H. So that was, this is the last, last segment I sort of looked at in detail. Um, so some general conclusions is, one, so it's very clear that travel patterns are complex. They vary over space and time. And so because of this, in order to classify them, there needs to be some method that's sort of sensitive to them. Um, so this work here is sort of an alternative method for doing this. I'm not saying it's the best method, but it's one sort of approach we can use to look at these really complex patterns. And so these tools, or these methods are more tools for sort of describing, explaining the sort of complex movement we see over space and time. Um, and so on the methodological side, um, I think, you know, using these sort of transform elements, using these transforms to transform this pattern into some sort of frequency space is promising. Um, there are several aspects of this that obviously require more investigation. And so one is some trade-off between the resolution of your representative pattern and the information I retain. And so that was a bit of a subtle point. But in, the future, in your feature extraction, if you sort of retain all of your coefficients, then you run the risk of capturing a lot of white noise. But if you retain you know, fewer coefficients, then your resolution goes down. Um, and so there's some trade-off there that needs to be sort of considered. And I need to figure out a way to sort of deal with mode choice so that it can manifest itself much more clearly. And some future work. And so the original intention of this was to apply this towards looking at EV market segments. And so one thing about EV sort of adoption is part of it is the envisionment of how people use these vehicles. And so there's some need to sort of account for the way people make their sort of unplanned trips. And so where I saw this work fitting in was it was meant to be as a initial stage of that to sort of provide me with some sort of classification of people's space time constraints for the purpose of genera gener uh, synthesizing some sort of unplanned trips. And so there's some use of this in sort of residential location choice as well. Um, and so, like I said, there should be some inclusion of land use measures. And then it can also be used as a starting point for subsequent choice modeling, which um, you know, everyone likes to do. Um, well, that's the last slide. OK. Any questions? Oh, OK, great. <laughs> no. Um, just, um, just wondering if you also um, thought about, instead of just distance from home, if you looked at uh, distance displacement from the previous activity? Um, no. 
I mean, so I feel like that's sort of an added, you know, piece of randomness. So that varies more even from even you know relative to distance from home. So for this first pass, I want to ensure that dimensions I looked at had a wave-like form. So there's some sort of cyclical sort of process that's going on. So I thought distance from home was sort of the closest thing to that. Um, I could look at distance away from that sort of individual activities in the sort of trip, but that sort of complicates the problem, and so I didn't want to deal with it yet. But um, which doesn't mean I shouldn't deal with it. It's just you know something not for my initial sort of attempt at this. But I, was, I guess I was just thinking in terms of maybe giving more um, oh. uh, se separation by mode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's an issue. Um, I think I had to think more about it. I think part of it was the way I had defined the sort of where I was specifying the pattern for it. And so someone had suggested to me that I look at, instead of the mode choice for specific travel segments, the mode to specific activities. And so you know, in line with sort of your thought, that would work. So. Yes. So the data that you're using to develop yeah. is a one-day trip diary, correct? It is, yes. So often with one day, I mean, that one day for that one household may be an odd day or maybe very typical day. We, we usually don't worry about that too much for travel demand modeling purposes uh -huh. because the sample as a whole should be representative, yeah. from the 29 other days in the month. I actually am. Um, so ideally, it should have been a multi-day sort of data set. Um, but being that part of this work was to look at the OHAS data set, I was sort of constrained by that. Um, and so I had sort of envisioned using this for another multi-day data set, maybe the Puget Sound data set, which is a panel data set. But ideally, you'd want a longer pattern to look at versus just one slice. And so um, that would have probably led to a different classification, maybe. But um, I, I hadn't not looked at that yet, but that was something I was sort of considering. Yeah, so that's a yeah, good point. So, so this was for a one-day pattern. But you know, I guess in the ideal sense, this should be applied to a multi-day pattern where you looked at a whole week of travel. Yes? You uh, mentioned the uh, <coughs> usage of this uh, in, I guess, EV location or EV investment. If, if someone were to, I guess, go yeah. about doing that, would it be more of a problem of looking at the, the types of individuals in different segments? Would it be a Euclid Euclidean distance, essentially, from uh, a certain buffer around their travel? Um, where would, I guess, be the, the fruitful venture if you were to look at an investment in that way? Ah, so, well, I mean, so one issue with EV adoption has always been range anxiety, which I actually think is a myth. So most trips are actually within the range of a full battery, right? And so the sort of, you know, discussion goes is that we don't know who sort of the early adopters might be. So we know like the first adopters are sort of these innovative people who are, you know, just kind of about owning an EV. Um, but it's sort of identifying the segments for later stages that's problematic. And so, right, and seeing this work sort of contributing to that is it gives you different segments based on people's travels, right? And so some people had very long distances, so their activity space was huge. So they're unlikely to be sort of the early adopters, right? Then you had some people with, um, really small spaces, and so they were basically localized around their home. So these might be the sort of next stage of adopters. But that sort of needs to be, you know, thought out a bit more, obviously. And so, you know, part of the sort of add-on to this was to use these as a sort of way of generating or putting some constraints on generating unplanned trips. And so I think that's sort of another sort of component that could be looked at to sort of contribute to that um, original question about EV adoption. Yes. It seems like similar to the the EV application, you could do transit as well because like some of that the first segment you showed where they just go to work and come back, yeah. that should be the obvious market for transit, but it almost showed none. And maybe it's because you're in Region Two, but you know if you're a transit agency, those are the people you want to capture and trying to yeah. figure out where exactly. Where so that trades up. so this you know could be applied to that area as well. Um, and so that's one nice thing. And so as you mentioned, you know those people who had a very simple pattern with uh, you know, fewer sort of random activities, those are probably the more, maybe the more likely people to use transit, right? And so um, 
it's a matter of going back to these clusters and sort of thinking them, thinking of them in context of different sort of transportation sort of policies, um, which you know would be the next step. But, uh, like I said, I'm glad to get to this point personally. But yes. So uh, again, connected to that, um, so you'd have to go back and learn more about those people, you know, because if you're a marketing yeah. firm and you're trying to do yeah. transit or EVs, you want to yeah. go and know where they're located, what kind of homes they're in, and yeah. socioeconomics. Yeah. So did you connect with a lot of that information as well? Um, not yet. So I looked at the distribution of socioeconomic, you know, characteristics. But like I said, um, like, like, you know, this gentleman mentioned, I should probably look at land use patterns of, you know, these people as well. Where are they living? Where is their work location? And a sort of dimension that would have helped that sort of looking at transit market segments would have been the mode choice. And so looking to see how multimodal people are, whether they tend to um, be, you know, really staunch like bikers and walkers, et cetera, or whether they like to mix biking and walking and, and driving. And so some people might drive to work, then they might take their bicycle out in the evening, et cetera, for whatever reason. But um, that would have been an interesting piece to look at in terms of transit market you know, identification. But as you, you have seen, my sort of mode choice sort of dimension was kind of static, so yes. Um, is there any plan or consider consideration in the future to incorporate a EV survey into the study, asking people directly if something oh, uh, in this study? EV? Um, sure. I mean, in terms of the EV effort, we always want more data, right? And so. The other sort of alternative is for you to sort of guess on what the data might look like versus getting real responses. But um, so one sort of you know application of this again in EV sort of in my head that I was thinking was um, it should be used to sort of define different you know sort of segments to target in future surveys about EVs. And so you could have a general EV survey, or you could have something more tailored to different sort of segments to ask you know people the right questions about their patterns to sort of assess that. Um, but yeah, so I had intended this to be a springboard for that as well. And so these segments, they get used for a lot of different applications. It's hard to sort of you know, box myself into one application because I see so many. Um, but yeah, so it's meant to sort of um, be like a stepping stone to a very many other sort of set of applications. So yes, I guess Jennifer. Well, I've always OK. Um, I still want a little clarification on, on the data collection because I'm not exactly sure how that was done. Was that like a questionnaire, like a survey, and like how how did you get that data? Oh, I didn't collect the data. So it's from the OHAS data set, which is something the state collects, right? And so these diaries get sent out to households, and they fill out what they did for the day. And so based on this diary, then you have information on what people did throughout the day. And I use that data set for this purpose. And so I didn't actually do the data collection, no. Uh, and, and then so with a follow-up, would um, in the future, uh, could you see this being applied where you're using like GPS data instead of doing a, a survey? Apply to GPS data. Uh, yeah, especially with distance from home. So in this case, I actually only calculated the Euclidean distance. I probably should have calculated the root distance, which you know, would have required me knowing the specific route people took. And so GPS data sort of contributes to that, right? So it gives you a trace over what happens um, between one origin to one destination. So uh, that's one application. Yeah, so it's right here. Um, did everybody who filled out the, the diary fill it out on the same day? No, they didn't, but they were all weekdays, or okay. you know, okay. most of them. Was it, was it spread throughout the year, or was it all one time a year? Because um, I don't ride my bike much in the winter. Yeah, um, and so they were for different days. Um, they can't actually remember the years, but they should have been spread out over the year. Um, but so you're correct. So there's some sort of weather effect on travel um, that that would have sort of you know told a different story maybe. So some seasonal effects. Um, and so I guess the short answer is you know it should be representative over the year. But in terms of capturing the effects of weather, you know you'd have to have another data set for that. So that you know. Well, I was just thinking the effects of light. Oh, OK. Which, which is easy to calculate from date. OK. Well, I could do that too, yes. So I'll take that suggestion to consideration. So yes. Curious if you could use this uh, data set and the methods that you're proposing for more of a micro 
level analysis of, let's say, specifically pedestrians' uh, travel behavior on, let's say, a congested downtown area or a campus, college campus or something yeah, of that nature? Yeah. So it would have been interesting to sort of segment based on another sort of, I guess, sample. And so in this sample, I had taken people that had work tours in their daily patterns, right? So I could have defined it differently and said, well, I only want to look at people that made pedestrian walking trips and see what sort of patterns they had. Um, and so, you know, the sort of possibilities are infinite in some sense. Um, so that, you know, I probably could have looked at that too, but I haven't done it yet. But So that would be interesting, yeah. Oh, yeah, keep it. Oh. Um, are there other data sets that uh, might give us a, a, a better um, multi day uh, experience of tra you know, tracing particular the people for long times? Like the, yeah, the DOE is doing a study for all of the electric car, uh -huh. many sure. of the electric car uh, using mm -hmm. GPS. Yes. Um, but I don't know if there are other studies for you know, regular folks. Um. There's studies. Well, there's a lot of multi-day data sets out there, right? So some of them are international. So there's a Dutch data set that's over a month, which would have been, you know, also interesting to look at. Um, there's a Puget Sound data set. The, the BATS data set is over two days. Um, and so that's another sort of uh, data set you might look at as well. Um, so there are other data sets. Um, it's, I didn't have access to them at this, you know, time, so. Yes. Your approach, basically, you're taking data yes. and using some transformations and algorithms yes. to define the segments. Yes. Another approach would be to start with the policy. Let's say the policy implication is what's who's the market for EVs, yes. and say, well, the reasonable, uh, the best market for an EV is someone who 90% of their travel uh, they only travel 40 miles a day, or somehow predetermine what are the segments that match my policy objective, and then look at the data and see. And I'm just wondering if you've thought about what are the pros and cons of those different approaches. Yeah. Well, I mean, in your approach, when you predefine a, a sample, right, you're sort of limiting yourself to those people. And so you have to sort of ensure that if you're looking at EV adoption, that no one else from some other segment or some significant subs, you know, part of the sample you left out would have been sort of the potential EV adopters. And so, um, so I mean, so that's one trade-off, you know, I, I needed to see is if you had originally limited to a sort of a priori defined sample that, that may not have, you know, captured enough sort of variation or, you know, such not, you might miss some people. Yes. You still are going to have to say, well, segments A, B, and C are my best potential market, right? Yeah. So you're still going to have to apply that level of a decision. And in, until you're in a case where you actually, people have adopted EVs, uh -huh. and you know who adopted them, yeah. and then your answer yeah. is yes. there for Yes, more you. clear. Yes. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, so at the end of this, you still have to pick sort of segments that you think are potential adopters, but my sort of thought on that is there should probably be some subsequent analysis for each segment to sort of guide you in that sort of decision. And so in addition to just looking at, you know, the distribution of things, you might want to look at, you know, the mode, the mode choice within each segment and see how sensitive they are to sort of different factors. And so that probably would give you a sort of um, additional sort of piece of information to look at. Um, yes. I have a, another question. It's kind of two in one. The, uh, do you know if any of the other classification methods have been used for EV marketing? And then um, has your data set been classified using some of the other methods you mentioned earlier? Um, no. Um, so in response to your first question in terms of EV, identifying EV markets, and so a lot of that work you know, has been sort of based on existing observed patterns, right? And so obviously we don't know who the actual EV adopters are. Um, I don't know if any of these sort of methods have been applied to them. I don't think so, not in the literature review I did. Um, and so, you know, so that's sort of one, 
reason for me to do this was sort of to see, you know, what, what I, you know, based on my set of analysis, what market segments were for that. Um, in terms of me applying this to, I think you asked applying this to like other data sets that. Oh. No, I'm sorry. The, the data set you had was used in oh. in other classifications. The the uh, more no, I, so. So um, no, not not the OHAS data set. Um, and so one sort of sort of follow up thing to this I had thought was to use some other classific classification method in the same OHAS data set to sort of make a comparison of different methods. And so it's my thought that you know they may not be sort of one method that's universal. It's probably you know something different for each sort of you know set of questions you're looking at. Um, but I think this works well for looking at you know complete patterns versus if you really just cared about mode choice. Right, and so you wanted to segment people based on mode choice. I probably wouldn't use this. I would probably just you know, recommend you use some kind of discrete choice model and do some latent class you know model based on that. So, yes. Um, do, do you plan on repeating this analysis on one of the metropolitan data sets? Um, sure, if I get the opportunity to. But I mean, data is hard to get, right? I think I was lucky to get this data set. And so, um, if you know if someone has data they want to give me. And they want me to run this and sort of see. I, I have no problems with that. Uh, that would, you know, be interesting. And you could do some sort of cross geography sort of comparison, which I thought would be interesting. Um, and so, so yeah. I mean, there's that data out there, and it's given to me. Sure. Yes. I was wondering your your pad your sec, your first step with the pattern space. You ended up with three dimensions, right? Distance to home activity type and travel mode. Yeah. Did you find that that explained enough or were there ones that you thought, hey, maybe there's household interaction or they have multiple cars yeah, or yeah. other so dimensions you'd like to add? Those were three dimensions that I could easily use and I thought they covered a, a wide range of sort of dimensions. Another one I would have looked at is sort of, you know, the sort of traveling together sort of pattern. And so there's a lot of escorting that goes on. And like conceptually, I had thought, oh, I should really account for this somehow, but I hadn't really thought of a good way of sort of extracting that sort of pattern yet. And so, um, like many things, it's sort of on my mind, but I, I don't have a sort of direct answer about how to address that yet. Um, but hopefully, given more thought, I can sort of address that. But that you know would have been another sort of interesting thing to sort of capture the correlation between these patterns as well. Um, so right now, they're all independent, and so they get classified individually. And then with yeah. EVs, it seems like if you have two vehicles, it's a lot easier than just one. So yeah. you know, that might be a very good explainer of EVs that's not in that dimension. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, so yes, I will you know, consider that definitely. So, so yes. OK. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit about why um, why do you hypothesize that the mode choice is so insensitive in the data? Is it because of the, oh, for example, the choice yeah, of the index, so. or just maybe what are your guesses there? So if you remember the pattern I specified from the mode choice sort of index, uh, uh, we have to go all the way back. So here, so it was, I mean, there's, there's like these you know random spikes here and there, um, and so I think because of that. The sort of the way this method works, it, it might have considered these as sort of like random spikes. So that's one part of it is because I used the Wolf transform. I don't think it was very good for this purpose, but it was. I think it was better for looking at distance. And so, um, I could have considered a different transform for each sort of dimension. But I hadn't figured out how to do sort of that sort of combined thing yet. But um, so that's one reason why it was insensitive. And so, one note on these sort of composite images is. So these are composite images. And so you saw a big dip, dip here because it meant that everyone in the segment was basically traveling at one time. And so, um, and so this sort of says, you know, you know, these people were sort of taking uh, the auto mode. But if that doesn't happen, then you get sort of you know, this sort of composite that's a mean of everything. And so it's really hard to see that definition. And so that kind of gets confounded. But uh, it's something I had to deal with as well. So. everyone for coming. I want to thank Roger. Before we thank him, 
Um, I don't have a speaker for next week to announce because we're done. Uh, but we do have a great lineup for winter term. It'll show up on the web uh, shortly. So take a look um, uh, when it's up there, and we hope to see you then. Thank you very much.